Hello and welcome. In this lecture video, I'm going to start off by talking about the idea of perverse incentives, which relates to the idea that you get what you measure, which is how we concluded the prior lecture video talking about that's a key idea in managerial accounting. So I thought it'd be interesting to spend a minute or two talking about the idea of perverse incentives. Then we'll do some example problems dealing with the behavior of variable and fixed costs. And then we'll talk about some ethical considerations in managerial decision making. So this is a good article. It's a little bit old, but it's still relevant. And it's from Forbes. And you can see the URL up here at the top. And it talks about perverse incentives. And so when we talk about perverse incentives, we're talking about unintended consequences of different incentive structures. So if we read this one, for example, um, Incentives matter in economics, and they also matter in terms of managerial accounting. That's something we'll talk a lot about in this class. If they're set up the right way, incentives, be it bonuses, subsidies, or stock options, you can get people to do what you want them to do. But be careful. Sometimes those can have unintended consequences, also known as perverse consequences, perverse incentives, that result in, be in behaviors on the bar on the part of employees or anybody else that are unintended unintended and run against the incentive structure that you tried to set up. So for example, we say on Wall Street, year-end bonuses are made sense until traders discover they could reap million dollar rewards by hiding a lot of risk. And then also in terms of Main Street, this is kind of interesting, perverse incentives are also commonplace. Here we have a father of six who blogs. One evening, the father and his wife decided to incentivize their kids to clean up their toys. So they offered the kids candy. This achieved the immediate goal, which is cleaning up their toys. But it also had unintended consequences. While each kid was sucking on their own piece of candy, their four-year-old walked up to the six-year-old, a four-year-old, and whispered, Tomorrow we need to make another mess so we can get some more candy. And so there are a whole lot of other examples, and this was a good one too. Uh, take, for instance, the 19th century paleontologist who paid local Chinese peasants for every fossil fragment that they brought in. This led locals to smash the fossils into multiple fragments before bringing, in them, bringing those in, and that maximized their payments. IBM had a similar problem when it decided to pay programmers by the line, and they responded by maximizing the lines of code that they wrote, but writing programming code with more lines of code could actually make the program run slower. Budgeting also has tons of perverse incentives, okay? So I guess the take home message is you get what you measure, but how you measure people could result in unintended consequences, and you need to think through those before you set up the measurement system, whatever measurement system you want to implement, okay? So I'm going to pause the lecture video now and then come back to discussing some example problems. Hello and welcome back. So let's take a look at some of these example problems. So which of the following is the difference between financial and managerial accounting? Managerial accounting is not concerned about the past. It's concerned about the future. So that's not right right away. Managerial accounting is concerned for external users. No, that's wrong. Financial accounting is rather detailed. No, managerial accounting is detailed. Financial accounting is summarized. So that one's wrong. This is the right answer, not just by the process of elimination, but let's talk about why. Managerial accounting does use monetary and non-monetary non information. Remember the example that I gave about customer satisfaction. Financial accounting, the balance sheet, income statement, statement of retained earnings, statement of cash flows, only reports, focuses on monetary information. Okay. So let's look at this example. So this, this is a good problem that helps us apply what we know about behavior, but be, variable and fixed cost behavior to solve business problems and make business decisions. So our company right here produced and sold 600 boxes of chocolate covered popcorn and had total variable costs of $2,100. Each box sells for $12. 
if production and sales are supposed to increase by 10% next month, which of the following is true? So total variable costs are expected to be 1785. Well, if you increase production by 10%, we would expect that total variable costs also increase. So total variable costs are 2100 at 600 boxes, okay? You would expect they would be more than $2,100 if we increase production by another 60 boxes, which is 10%. You would expect that it would be more because we know that variable costs increase or decrease in total with the level of activity. So as the level of activity increases, total variable costs also increase. In this case, this is lower than this with an increase in production, so we know that is not right, right off the bat. We can look at the next option. Variable cost per unit is expected to be $3.50, and indeed, this is the right answer. So let's talk about why that is. So if you go to Walmart and you buy 10 t-shirts for $100, how much did you spend per t-shirt? Well, all you did, it's $10, right? All you did is you took cost, $100 for the 10 t-shirts, divided by the number of t-shirts, and then that gives you the average cost per t-shirt, $10. If we apply that same formula right over here, we take total cost of $2,100 divided by my 600 boxes, gives me my $3.50 per box. $3.50 per box. Now, what do we know about variable cost per behavior? We know that variable costs per unit stay the same. So, if we increase production by 10%, as we see right there, we would expect that variable cost per unit still stay the same at $3.50. And think about that in terms of the context of the problem. We make chocolate-covered popcorn. It, the ingredients cost are $3.50 per box of popcorn. If we make an additional 60 boxes, which is 10% of the 600, would we expect that our ingredients cost per box of popcorn to change? No. It would stay the same at $3.50, right? Let's look at why this one is wrong. And we can, well, let me look at D first. You can see we calculated it at 350, so we know it's not 210. It's, it's asking the same thing. We know it's not 210. So that's, we just figured that out. So let's talk about why C is wrong. The incremental cost per unit is expected to be 35 cents. No, it's $3.50 per unit because that's the variable cost. The incremental cost, right? The incremental cost is making these additional boxes of popcorn, which costs us $3.50 per unit, okay? Not 35 cents, so that's not right, okay? What I want you to do is I want you to pause the lecture video and see if you can't do this problem. And before you do so, what I want you, I want you to, I want to show you something really quick before you do this, just to guide you in the right path. So our variable cost per unit is $8. Fixed costs is $5. Okay. When we make 4,000 units. So that means right away, total fixed costs will be equal to our $5 per unit right here times those 4,000 units. $20,000. That's our total fixed costs. Okay. So I wanted to show you that before I ask you to finish the problem. The other thing that you need to think about, this is when we make 4,000 units, variable cost is $8. What is the total cost of making 5,100 units? So that's going to include, and I'm asking for the total cost. So I'm asking for the total fixed costs and the total variable costs added together. That equals the total cost. Okay, you need to remember that variable costs per unit stay constant and that fixed costs in total stay constant. Now, with using those two hints, go ahead and pause the lecture video 
and solve the problem. Okay, so let's see how you did. You should have gotten B as the right answer. So as we move from 4,000 to 5,100 units, we know that variable cost per unit still stays the same. So what I can do is multiply my new level of activity, 5,100, times my variable cost per unit, and that gives me total variable costs of 40,800. 40, I know that my fixed costs in total are $20,000 at 4,000 units. What will fixed costs be in total at 5,100 units? Well, we know that fixed costs in total stay the same, so it will stay 20,000. Total variable costs of 40,800 plus total fixed costs of 20,000 give us total costs of 60,800. B is the right answer. And what I can show you right here is that remember that our discussions in the first lecture video, we're talking about the behavior of fixed costs per unit. Fixed costs per unit decrease as the level of activity increases. So I can take my 20,000 divided by my new higher level of activity of 5,100 gives me $3.92. Up here, my fixed costs per unit were $5 at 4,000 units. And then they decrease to 392 as I move from 4,000 units to 5,100 units. My fixed costs per unit now become 392, okay? So let's look at this next problem. Hanover Binding plans to produce 40,000 books next year at a total cost of 1,640,000, selling price per book of $66. Fixed cost total 280,000. Management is thinking about lowering the price to $60 per book and believes that this action will cause sales to climb to 50,000 books. What is the incremental profit if 50,000 books are sold? So we're gonna do this problem in steps. Step one. Calculate variable cost per unit. So that's what I want you to do. I want you to read the problem and see if you can't calculate out the variable cost per book or the variable cost per unit. And I want you to pause the lecture video and then do so. Okay, well, hello and welcome back. So you should have gotten $34 is the variable cost per book. I have my total cost, $1,640,000. That includes variable and fixed, and I subtract out my fixed costs of 280, 1,640,000 minus the 280 in the numerator, therefore I have the total variable costs. And I can divide that by the number of books to give me my variable cost per unit, okay? So what I want you to do next is calculate what's the total variable cost, what is total variable cost at 50,000 books, okay? at 50,000 book, books, and then also calculate the difference in variable cost between 40,000 books and 50,000 books. Hello and welcome back. So what I asked you to do is to calculate total variable costs at 50,000 books, 1.7 million, total variable costs at 40,000 books, and the way I got that is taking the level of activity times the variable cost per book, 1,360,000. The difference in variable cost, which is the dip, which is the incremental cost, is 340. I could have also just taken 10,000 times 34 to give me 340. Why is this also the incremental cost? Well, remember the incremental cost is the difference in cost between two alternatives. Those fixed costs of 280,000 will be the same. They will stay at 280,000 whether we make 50,000 books or 40,000 books, it doesn't matter. So the incremental cost, which is the difference in cost between making 50,000 and 40,000 books is simply the increase in variable cost, which is 340. What I want you to do now is to calculate the revenue, the difference in revenue between selling 50,000 books and selling our 40,000 books. And remember at 50,000 books, the price is 60. And at 40,000 books, the price is 66. So to calculate revenue, you multiply the sales price times the sales volume. So calculate the difference in revenue. Pause the lecture video and do so. Hello and welcome back. So you multiply 66 times the 40,000, 2,640. 60 times the 40,000 sales price times sales volume. We get in, and then we subtract them, we get incremental revenue of 360. And then to solve the problem, to calculate the incremental profit, 360 incremental revenue, 
340 incremental cost. The incremental profit is 20,000. Therefore, the right answer is B. Thanks.